But this kind of puts the two together. And I was trying to figure out a way to start this night. And popes have been at the forefront of Irish rebellion since probably the 1798 rebellion. Um, rebellion was always um, you know, fermented in fermented, of course, the word, fermented in the back rooms of pubs. Um, I was sort of thinking yesterday about this. I was at a function with Dublin publicans there not so long ago. And strange enough, through the conversation, we worked out that the 1916 Rising wouldn't happen today for a simple reason that pubs are open. Because uh, one publican mentioned after the water protests, the even after the water protests, there was a spike in business. So while everybody liked to go out and protest, the revolution wasn't part of their thing. Uh, so basically tonight I'm going to go through a little bit about the pubs and the rising, the publicans and the employees, the distilleries, the breweries, and we'll finish on the conclusion. <clears throat> the Irish are synonymous with the consumption of alcohol and having a good time. Have you ever wondered about the connection between beer, spirits and the foundation of the state? Alcohol, the production, the service and its consumption has played a key role in Irish affairs since the iconic moments of the 1916 Rising. Public houses, their owners and staff were at the heart of the action unfolding on the streets. When the initial plans for the Rising were started with confusion, when uh, McNeil put out a countermanding order. The rebel force in total was 1,467. And just to put that in some kind of perspective, by the end of Easter week, there were 21,000 British troops in Dublin. So they were on a hiding into nothing, as they say. So it meant that the rebels couldn't seize any of their main key targets. So the rebels never seized any British military barracks any garrison, any outpost, any sentry post. But what they did manage to seize was five distilleries, two breweries and nine public houses. <laughs> Sounds like a very Irish thing to do. <laughs> but they were actually all seized for some very strategic reasons. And I'll go through them then shortly. And it can also be said that without the barman, the rising itself would never have happened. Uh, because the barmen were delivering messages and they were storing weapons. And they were the eyes and ears of the rebel leadership on the British Army. <laughs> and also, don't forget now, like many of the leaders of rebels were teetotalers, uh, including Pierce, Mallon, Colbert, and Clark, yet Sean McDermott was a barman. So it was a bit of a dichotomy. But Pierce always wanted to make sure that in the 1803 rebellion of Robert Emmett, he gathered his rebels on. on Thomas Street to attack Dublin Castle. But unfortunately for Robert Emmett, there were too many pubs on the street, and his rebellion sent him into a drunken farce. And Pierce didn't want that. He wanted to make sure that the strict rules of military engagement were followed at all times. As the rebels seized their headquarters at the GPO, a detachment of men were seized to key buildings, seized key buildings along Abbey Street. They attempted to gain entry to Mooney's public house, but the manager slammed the door in their faces. Not even a shot at the lock would gain them entry. The rebels, led by Frank Drinnan, then seized the ship tavern, all, all, ordering all the customers out at gunpoint. The ship tavern was well known to the nationalists um, in the years leading up to the rebellion. Many of the plans for the rising, <coughs> Dallin was a big supporter of the Irish volunteers. Many of the plans for the rising were hatched in there because across the cross road in Reese's Chambers was Sean McDermott's office. So, you know, do a little planning work for him head back. Um, but to illustrate, even though they seized the ship, I just want to illustrate in the initial hours of the rebellion, the attitude towards drink by the rebels. In William Daly's witness statement, he said, in passing, I wish to record with pride that a few of the men in the company, in the ship tavern, although hardened drinkers, and had the taking of anything that was there, did not touch anything and refused the offerings of the barn. Part of the training of the Irish volunteers, they were told about seizing public houses, 
seasoned distillers, seasoned breweries, and they were warned by Pierce, Clark, and McDonough to make sure that there was no drink taken. And it was a punishment on their list of um, in the Irish Volunteers card, which they were given. They were instructed not to be drinking. <coughs> a detachment of men in the 80s was a young lad called James Joyce, and no relative of the famous James Joyce. But James Joyce was actually a barman in Davies. And you recognise that. Davies Pub, Portobello, um, O'Connell's next door to uh, A detachment of men was sent up by Sergeant, met by Sergeant Doyle, was sent up to seize JT Davies Pub. That's actually taken just after the rebellion. You can see, still see the British troops outside. Um, one of the men that went up to seize Davey, Davey was a justice of peace. He refused uh, Davey any time off to go training. Uh, Davey was 35 years old. He worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And the only time he got off to go training was when he pretended to be ill. He simply failed to turn up for work. At, bank holiday, at noon bank holiday Monday, Joyce and Doyle arrived up along the wall there, along to JT Davies. They had come up through Grafton Street, past um, St. Stephen's Green and Countess Marsh It was Michael Mallon who sent them onwards up to seize JT Davies' boat. And they narrowly avoided capture just further down the street at Adelaide Road when they were coming up towards the, the bridge, which is Portobello Bridge. Uh, a group of mounted soldiers came past them and they kind of hid in a corner. And they realised, Doyle, <coughs> Doyle realised that they let them get on they go up to the barracks and warn the, the British that something was up. Uh, but by the time they got around the corner to stop the British, the British had recognised the rebels were out for something and had already galloped off. When they got up as far as a shop, it was Tommy Gorman's butcher shop, which was next door, and Condren's pub, William Condren's pub, which was later O'Connell's pub. Um, they go up as far as Davies and they snuck in along the wall here. They ducked down to avoid all these big plate glass windows and they hid down low to get to the window, to get into the front door. Uh, all that was in the pub that morning, bank holiday Monday, it was quite warm. There's a couple of other lads in there drinking. One of them wrote a witness statement afterwards. He was told to get out in the name of the New Irish Republic. He said he did, as soon as he finished his bottle of Guinness and his short. There was no rush. Most of them were in there actually. He said himself he was discussing who was going to win the match later on. Strangled over playing Shamrock Rovers. So <laughs> uh, Joyce went in, went into the main doors. Davy himself was behind the counter. Uh, Joyce told Davy that he was seizing the pub with the name of the New Irish Republic. Uh, Davy just looked at him. He said, Look, lad. Uh, and after missing enough days off, you can take it from me. You have notice. You've got five minutes to get out of your sack. Uh, Joyce leveled his gun, fired a shot at the lovely plate, lovely glass, um, distillery glass behind the counter, and cleared them on it. Gone. Uh, so the rebels set about seizing and controlling this building. They used a lot of Davies furniture in the upper floors to barricade the windows. Their mission was to stop the British coming out of the Ratmines barracks. And it took up a couple of hours, another hour or two, before any movement came from, out, from the barracks. It took up sniping position in the windows. And up in the Portobello barracks, uh, there was a sergeant and there was a lieutenant. Their commander was actually on the weekend, the way for the weekend. So it was left to a young fellow. Uh, a lieutenant camel to take charge. So he sent out some troops to find out what was going on. There was a bit of commotion on the bridge. The rebels were at the cut in the tram lines. The bridge came down towards the bridge. The bridge is just here in front of us. And the rebels opened fire. The British scattered back up the rat lines road, got some reinforcements, and came back to the bridge. In the meantime, two policemen came along on the scene. Tried to stop the rebels cutting the tram wires, and uh, the rebels opened fire at them. And it was like a sport. 
crowd gathered, and the two policemen struggled to keep the crowd back in safety. Um, back on the Monday, I suppose those who couldn't go to Ferry House the races were watching the gunfire come out of the day before. The British organised themselves, they sent up a larger force of men up along the Rathmines Road and along the bridge in proper military fashion, the front row lying on their, on their bellies, the second row kneeling down and the row behind standing up and they started to return fire on the day's gun with their lieutenant at the back barking orders out them to continue fire. Rebels returned fire briefly and the British brought up a machine gun and brought it onto the bridge and I haven't got it with me on this, which I should have had. I used to work in that pub afterwards, and I found a picture of the pub after it had been peppered by British troops. They spent three hours firing at that pub. Three solid hours between the men lying along the wall and the machine gun. And after about three hours, <coughs> Lieutenant Cremel ordered a ceasefire.